Hello and welcome. My name is Jade Harvey Beryl. I'm the Wild Voices Program Manager at Seabeam uh, and here on behalf of Canada's uh, non-profit outdoor learning store today. Uh, on behalf of us and our partners, I'd like to warmly welcome you uh, to this session of our Canadian Outdoor Learning Spring Virtual Workshop Series. Uh, I'm very grateful to be joining you um, today from the traditional unceded territories of the Sinaiaks, the Silks, the Sutremic, and the Tanaha people. Thanks, Jade. And I'm Jade's co-pilot tonight. Uh, <laughs> For this evening. Really nice to see everybody here. My name is Duncan Wittick and I'm here uh, as Executive Director of Seabean as well as Canada's Outdoor Learning Store and I'm super grateful to be joining you from the homelands of the Tanaha and the Shushwap uh, here in southeast British Columbia. So we know that in the context of outdoor learning, it's sort of fundamental to develop your understanding of local indigenous knowledge and perspectives and to take the time to sort of nurture those relationships uh, with the people who've called this place home for millennia. Um, and so we encourage you to consider what you can do to deepen your understanding. And in this precise moment, perhaps you could share in the chat which indigenous territories you're joining us from this evening. While you're doing that, I just wanted to also acknowledge um, that we're all going through some pretty challenging times right now. And I know a lot of you in the school systems, things have been changing a lot lately, our friends in Alberta and in Ontario and, and all over the country. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and acknowledge that we are excited to be bringing this series to you at this time because we know that outdoor and environmental learning is so important at this time and of course um, in the long term as well. So on behalf of our, um, our 20 plus partners who are bringing this series to you, um, yeah, just really glad to be able to connect with you in this way this evening. Fantastic. Um, just let that roll out. Thank you for, for sharing all of that information. And so, um, to get a better sense of who's in the room, we've actually got a couple of polls for you that we would like to, to share and engage with. Duncan, I might ask you to hit that button, please. Absolutely. Actually, you're, you have permission now. If you oh, wanna... fantastic. I do like when I get to be in charge of launching the poll. <laughs> feels like you're sort of an astronaut or something launching into space. So where are you joining us from? Let's launch that poll. Obviously, you've told us a little bit about your territory and what does that mean in terms of our provinces or that we have. So we're racking up there. I'm going to give it another 10 seconds. We've got 76% of people voted majority kind of split between BC and Ontario. We've got representation from every single province though on there. That's fantastic. We're so close. I'm going to give you another five seconds to participate and show us where you're from. Four, three, two, one. So let's share those results. So BC wins just uh, closely followed by Ontario. And again, we have a representation from everyone. So that's fantastic. Our next poll is what kind of educator are you? It's, uh, are you you know, a formal teacher? Are you a community educator who's working in a public sphere, the schools? Um, are you a policy maker? Share with us uh, your expertise and then we can have an idea of who we're connecting with today. Okay, just again, going to give you another five or so seconds just to share your your story with us very briefly there. Three, two, one. Okay, and the results are in. Um, the vast majority are elementary school teachers, which makes perfect sense if we're trying to learn about teaching kids about climate change. And then also happy to see some high school teachers and every kind of educator that we can think of that we uh, put into that poll is represented. So I love that diversity. That's excellent. 
for those of you uh, that are just joining us um, and haven't used Zoom before, I know that's probably unlikely at this, <laughs> this time and things, you can put your questions into the chat. Somebody's moderating that. So if you do have questions, write them in there. We'll note them down. And when we'll get to these key moments, we'll share them with Ian and, and, and pick his excellent brain. Um, we're going to, you please stay muted if possible. And um, if you would like to see your faces, we don't, we should be able to accommodate video. So if you'd like to do that, but it's up to you entirely if you want to leave your video on or not. Um, we are going to have a presentation, then we'll do some Q&A, like I said, with those uh, chat questions that we've held on to. And then there may be some, there's definitely going to be some prizes. So please stay until the end and enjoy in the gifts that we will have for you. Um, we will be sending out a recording of this tomorrow and a certificate of attendance uh, will be available for those of you who are interested. So moving on, this all sounds a bit exciting. There's a little bit of a list going on and it's gonna be quite fast, um, but I'm just going to bring up our, uh, our presentation for you so that we can be ready to go and sharing with you what's happening. Jade and I are gonna give you a rapid fire introduction to 21 now, amazing organizations who are many of whom are available and ready to work with you um, and so we've partnered with these 20 organizations from coast to coast to coast um, through the outdoor learning store and and yeah just excited to have this community represented here so without further ado let's uh run through the let's list. begin Take Me Outside raises awareness and facilitates connection and outdoor learning in schools across Canada. And we also stock their Take Me Outside weatherproof student journals in the outdoor learning store. And the Pacific Foundation for the Understanding of Nature is amazing. They've offered up a thousand dollar gift card for the store for next year, next school year's Take Me Outside for Learning School Year Challenge. So make sure you sign up for that. Um, yeah. Ecom. This is Canada's national bilingual and charitable umbrella network for environmental learning. They just had an amazing conference and they host those. So make sure you sign up for the next one so you get all that great info. And Green Teacher, who, we're, uh, who Ian Shanahan is here from tonight. Um, and you're gonna be here hearing lots more about Green Teacher, but they are an amazing resource and highly recommend you check out their website. Green Learning, uh, they offer free online education programs about energy, climate change and green economy. They empower students to create positive change. There's some good uh, lessons in there and, and um, it's a good thing to check out. And Natural Curiosity, we are hosting them for a, a workshop next week. So Haley Higdon is joining us, sharing their resource book, which is available um, in French and English. And yeah, an amazing resource and workshops to go with it. Water Rangers, we hosted um, their workshop on Tuesday. The recording is up uh, on our website if you want to have a look. Uh, they support the collection of water data on their open data platform uh, with a goal of providing communities with the tools they need to take care of lakes, rivers, and oceans. Their water test kits come in big, sort of medium, tiny, and they're fantastic uh, for students to learn with, and they're available again in the store. I think that was over your 10 second limit there, Jade. <laughs> Get in trouble, everyone. I'm me, Farheen. So CBN, I get to be their executive director. They're an amazing organization. Check them out. EPSA, BC's Environmental Educators Provincial Specialist Association, provide network curriculum support and leadership for teachers you should join. <laughs> WildSight is an incredible organization and Jade is actually part of this organization who provides wonderful ways of connecting um, young people with the land. Bear with us. There's more of them, but they're fantastic. The Global Environmental and Outdoor Education Council is a resource for teaching in global environmental and outdoor ed. Conferences, workshops, teaching ideas. You can check out their website. Sask Outdoors for you prairie dwellers uh, in the audience. Um, they are incredible. I've worked with them for, oh, geez, uh, 20 years. I, I'd say they're, they're fantastic and have wonderful workshops, including a project wet workshop coming up. You can find them on saskoutdoors.org. 
Um, moving further west, the Alberta Council for Environmental Education works to, to advance environmental education in Alberta. Systems level approach is the way that they're engaging education leaders, school districts, teachers, youth leaders, and the rest. Um, they want the next generation to be environmental stewards, and they've got resources, events, and workshops at their website there. Stoke Mountain Science. I shouldn't be saying this, Jade should. This is her uh, amazing organization that develops and delivers high quality, safe and affordable programs. So definitely check out that website. Thank you. Get Outside and Play, great partner, offering resources, workshops um, for early childhood educators and young children, whether you're a parent or an educator. Really helpful. OC, uh, they're hosting their big conference. I know a number of you are registered this coming uh, Friday, Saturday, um, and it's really affordable. And there are prizes available from the Outdoor Learning Store. So I encourage you to check it out and sign up. Classroom to Communities or C2C is a BC collaborative of partners committed to providing place-based educational leadership. Uh, we're hoping you'll join us for their summer solstice networking event on June 17th. You can check it out at the link or at the CBEAM website. And the Kootenai Boundary Environmental Education Collaborative, we think is the only collaboration of superintendents in the country who are working solidly together to advance outdoor and environmental learning. And they've got some wonderful resources that apply Canada-wide. Learning for a Sustainable Future, or LSF, integrate principles of sustainable development into education policy. They've got curriculum on there and um, they've got so many resources for you to look at on their website. And imagine Ed, uh, Jillian Judson's on the line, the catalyst uh, for this. They've got some incredible resources the walking curriculum, engaging imagination in ecological education. And it's not too late if you want to register for their walking curriculum challenge. I think over 700 educators have now registered and um, it's a 30 day challenge. So you can sign up at the link. Eco Schools Canada, our final one. We've made it through. Uh, they work to nurture environmental leaders, reduce the ecological impact of schools and build sustainable school communities. You should have a look at what they have on offer. And without further ado, it is time to get to the meat and potatoes of this fantastic workshop. Um, and let me introduce Ian Shanahan, who's going to teach us today um, or talk to us today about teaching kids and teens about climate change. Um, He's an educator, nature guide, writer, editor, biological consultant, visual and performing artist. Ian's combined passions of nature, education, art, writing and editing have led him to Green Teacher, where he's been the general editor since 2018. He also conducts biological surveys, professional workshops and field trips for Shrew, connecting people to nature, you know, alongside running two different podcasts, talking with green teachers and earthy chats and just being a general nature buff and sort of nature wizard if you will so welcome Ian thank you for joining us well thank you so much and it is a great honor to be here alongside all the wonderful partners uh, I know it's a lot going through a list of 21 but uh, it's very much worth hearing about all the great organizations and everything that they're doing so thank you for doing that and thank you for the opportunity of having me here today this is not an easy topic but uh, we are not going to spend time on the doom and gloom. And we're going to look at proactive solutions oriented approaches to teaching kids and teens about climate change. So let me just share my screen here and we shall get started. So as Jade mentioned, I am the Daddy. general editor of Green Teacher. Oh, that's what I have to look forward to in about five and a half weeks. That's why we scheduled this one for uh, early May. My uh, partner and I are expecting our first child. So Congratulations. A, 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 a timely preview right there. Um, so yes, I, I am representing uh, Green Teacher this evening, one of uh, many hats that I wear. And I would just like to first acknowledge that 
Our main office is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, Huron, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississauga peoples. And this territory is covered by the Williams Treaty. You can find more about the traditional peoples of the land that you are on at native-land.ca. Don't forget that hyphen. I've made that mistake before. Uh, it's a wonderful resource uh, to learn about the first peoples on the lands and watersheds where you reside. Uh, so right off the beginning here, I, I have to say I'm not a frontline researcher in climate science, nor am I uh, involved in climate policy. I'm an environmental educator. That's the, the role that I play in the response to climate change. Uh, climate education, as we'll talk about, has a big role to play in the global response. Uh, I'm certainly both in a professional and personal, personal capacity uh, a major learner and student of climate change, climate science, climate policy, and everything related to it. This is just a small sampling of, of some of the reading. Uh, this is not going to be our primary focus, however, the contents of books, uh, many of which I'm sure a good number of you have read. We're going to, in fact, start with a story about some bird poop. Bear with me. There is a method to the madness. So we'll start with a somewhat provocative question. What's the big deal about some bird poop? You can see it just on a leaf there in that picture. Well, let's wind the clocks back to August 29th, 2003. Now it is a bit scary to think that I was in high school and this is coming up to being close to 20 years ago. Uh, but this story begins on August 29th, 2003. And uh, that was an interesting date because it was two weeks after a rather, a rather incredible stargazing night on August the 14th. So for those of us in the Eastern time zone in the Great Lakes region, you may remember on August 14th, 2003, there was a massive blackout late in the afternoon that extended into the evening and in some areas overnight. And true story, I was scheduled to present uh, a slide presentation at the outdoor theater of Presque Isle Provincial Park, where I was working at the time. And the topic was life at night. Well, without electricity, I was not able to operate the slide projector, which was an actual slide projector where the slides would get jammed. And if you didn't put them in upside down and backwards, everything was off. So I didn't have to deal with that on that particular night. But I still went to the outdoor theater wondering if anybody would show up. Well, lots of people showed up and everybody knew that the power was out and they knew that they were not going to be seeing a slideshow, but they still showed up. And we ended up having one of the most memorable stargazing nights. Uh, I had the foresight to print out some extra star charts and we all enjoyed seeing the summer triangle and some of the other constellations that are visible at that time of the year. But getting back to August 29th, so two weeks after the blackout, uh, I was talking to my boss and as was basically an unofficial rule, if you didn't have a butterfly net in your hand while outside, uh, you would be reprimanded or at least scolded and held accountable by your coworkers. So I was talking to my boss and then I just booked it away from my boss, which is not maybe the best thing to do mid conversation at the end of the summer, the end of the summer contract is bolt away from your boss with a butterfly net. And yes, that's me with the shaggy hair way back in 2003, bolting away from my boss and why was I doing that? What was I going after? Well, I had a butterfly net, so spoiler alert, I was going after a butterfly and a particularly interesting butterfly, a giant swallowtail. It's the largest butterfly species in Canada. It's really hard to miss. It looks like a bird, honestly, when you see it. Much bigger than a hummingbird, much bigger in terms of wingspan than a lot of different birds. And uh, I didn't end up catching it, but it's one of those butterflies you obviously don't need to catch to tell what it is. It's, a, it's big, it's beautiful, easy to identify. And it was the very first record of that species uh, in, in the county, in fact, not just in the park, in the county. So that was very exciting. And at, at 16, 17 years old, I, I thought, oh, I'm going to be in the park records and glory will be with my name and all of those sorts of things. But again, what does this have to do with some bird poop? Or what's the big deal about some bird poop? Well, let's zoom in on this photo. 
This photo was taken about a decade later, which is nine years later, on June 10th, 2012. And if you, the perceptive eye might notice, what appeared to be bird poop at first has appendages. This is in fact not bird poop, this is the larva or caterpillar of a giant swallowtail. So 2003, first one showed up in southeastern Ontario where I lived. Less than a decade later, they're breeding quite, uh, quite profusely in southeastern Ontario. So a lot changed in a very short period of time. Now, on one hand, I was very excited. Hey, this bold, beautiful butterfly is now common where I live. Great. However, this is connected to a larger process. And this is what connects us to our talk this evening, teaching kids and teens about climate change. This story, and I know for those who went to Jillian, Judson, Jillian Judson's presentation um, about imaginative, edu imaginative education, storytelling is a major part of that. And I thought I would lead in with a story that connects to climate change because stories engage our emotional core. And this story is also local in scope. And we're going to talk a lot about making climate change relevant in a local context. So there we have it, the giant swallowtail story as an entry point to the larger system of climate change. So we're going to talk this evening or this afternoon or even this morning, depending on which time zone you are joining us from, uh, whatever time zone you are in. Today, we are going to talk about the why, but most importantly, the how. We've probably all read at least summaries of the, the big IPCC report from October of 2018 about reaching that 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, temperature rise above pre-industrial levels. That's the big mark. That's what we hear about and for good reason. And we know that the window of opportunity for reducing emissions to be able to achieve that target is getting ever closer. Uh, 2030 is the number that we, or the year that we hear about. So that part of the why is fairly straightforward and particularly for this audience, uh, not something I really need to spend a tremendous amount of time on. And of course you can read the full report at ipcc.ch. Uh, it's very in depth, but uh, an essential read. In this context, in the context of education, we're going to focus more on the role that education can play. And this is something that's actually been quantified uh, by Project Drawdown. And for those who are not familiar, and I've got the book right here, and I'm, I'm not affiliated or associated with it. This is just one of the many climate change books that I have on my shelf. Uh, Project Drawdown is a collaborative of many different scientists, climate scientists, who wanted to take a solutions-oriented approach to climate change and the response to climate change. And they ended up ranking 80 different solutions to the climate crisis, crisis in Project Drawdown, which you can find on drawdown.org. You can get the book as well in, uh, in any bookstores. Of course, I would recommend going to your local bookstore. Jeff Bezos is plent has done plenty well enough over this past few months. Uh, Project Drawdown ranks, as I say, the different climate solutions based on the number of gigatons of CO2 or equivalents that can be drawn down or reduced from the atmosphere. And for those familiar with this, you might know that health and education is very high on the list. In fact, it's ranked as the second most impactful solution. And it has been quantified at 85.42 gigatons of CO2 equivalent reduced or sequestered between 2020 and 2050. In particular, if you read into this, you read the chapter in the book, and you can even find this on the website. In fact, this is a screenshot from the website. You can see that uh, educating girls is uh, a specific aspect of the education. And it, just reading that first paragraph, uh, education lays a foundation for vibrant lives for girls and women, their families and their communities. It is also one of the most powerful levers available for avoiding emissions by curbing population growth. So education, does have a quantifiable role to play in this uh, on top of all of the other solutions uh, that we need. And, and certainly 
it's not just one solution. And if we can have a competition among solutions and everybody's trying for solutions, we'll take it. We'll use them all. We, we don't have the time to pick and choose, bring every, everybody on board and work together towards these solutions. But of course, we'll spend time in the education space. And as we shift our focus to talking about the how, we're going to be looking at Green Teacher's two most recent book publications, Teaching Kids About Climate Change and Teaching Teens About Climate Change. Uh, all the proceeds for sales of these books directly from Green Teacher go right back into the nonprofit. These two books are also available at the Outdoor Learning Store, uh, which Duncan and Jade have mentioned uh, already in this presentation. And the advantage of these two books and the approach that was taken in the creation of, of these books was very practical, very hands-on, and very immediate. These books function as toolboxes. And this is actually a picture of a toolbox with tools that I inherited from my father, who was of the mind of, why have one hammer when you can have 11? So there were many duplicate tools that I uh, <laughs> have since come to enjoy. And I like the image of a toolbox because it shows people that this isn't something that strictly lives in a cerebral space. This happens in the here and now, and it's based on action that can be done. I should also mention that I cannot take any credit whatsoever for the production of these books. The credit goes primarily to my predecessor, Tim Grant, who is still with Green Teacher as the publisher and in a more executive and advisory role. But he was the editor of our Teaching Kids About Climate Change book and the co-editor with his partner, Gail Littlejohn, in the Teaching Teens About Climate Change book. So a big thanks to, to Tim for putting these two toolboxes together. And we're going to open these two toolboxes and look at some hands-on activities that can be used with minimal prep because teachers in all educational settings tend not to have a tremendous amount of time. So we'll start with looking at the how based on teaching kids about climate change. And we talked just briefly about the IPCC report. This is not something that I recommend talking about with kids. It's high level. There are lots of very alarming things in it, particularly those who've read it will, will know some of the projections of high confidence are quite stark, uh, particularly models that talk about four, five, six degrees Celsius uh, rises. So not recommended to go there with kids. I'm going to borrow a quote, a quote from the presenter from the second workshop in the series, David Sobel. And many of you, I'm sure, have heard this quote or a paraphrase of it. No tragedies before fourth grade. So around age nine uh, is the point at which it is developmentally appropriate to start talking about some of the more disruptive aspects of climate change and start entering into the space of climate crisis. But prior to that, it is not effective. I can remember when I first learned about global warming and the process of global warming and greenhouse gases and talk about the ice caps melting. I was in fact in grade three and uh, no uh, disrespect to my teacher at the time, but uh, I, I can personally say I don't think that was the appropriate time for me to learn about it because it did, did cause a tremendous amount of anxiety for my very young eight-year-old mind and I carried that with me through my formative years. Uh, so this is something that uh, that I take very seriously in my educational work and the climate change books are very much based on this principle and in fact mentioned in the introductions that Tim Grant wrote uh, for both of those books. We're going to focus on uh, two main dimensions here in teaching kids about climate change and these also can overlap very much with teaching students of older grades, but uh, these are particularly useful with young kids. And we're going to start with starting local. We might hear about Miami sinking. If we've never been to Miami, there's a lot less personal or local relevance to that. Not to say that that's not an essential part of the broader discussion, of course it is, but uh, it's maybe not the most effective starting point, particularly with young minds. So start local. One of the activities in the book by Jackie Oblack is uh, titled, Is Climate Change Good for Us? And though it seems a, a bit of a provocative title, 
there, there's more to it. You might lead in an activity like this with a story like my giant swallowtail story. Uh, this is not specifically outlined in the activity, but it's, it's a useful icebreaker starting point just to, to get the conversation rolling. And also keep in mind that stories create positive associations with a topic. They engage the perceptive aspects of young minds. And this story for me would be an appropriate entry point to a lesson like this because it's very local in nature. It's very relevant to my life. I'm a, a self-professed nature geek and I can be found out with a butterfly net uh, going after <laughs> insects to find out what they are. And, and this is a story that's related to climate change because giant swallowtails and their presence in southeastern Ontario is directly related to the warming trend and the longer growing season and the uh, warmer winters that has made their the north part the northern part of their range expand farther northward and they are in fact now on the southern edge of the Canadian Shield in the the rugged terrain that's often associated with more northern parts of Canada so they they continue to move northward even since that story so that's a good starting point for finding that local connection and on one hand I might say if I were to live in a vacuum and just sort of selfishly think, well, if I like butterflies, climate change is, is good because I get to see the, the biggest butterfly in Canada now in my backyard, potentially, you know, coming to my pollinator garden. That's great. Well, this is where you can engage younger students in systems thinking. And systems thinking may seem like a broad topic, but it's certainly accessible for younger minds. And this is where you can look at some of the types of changes that come from a warming planet and look at what are the local impacts on you in your life? How would it affect you? And then that second question, which connects more to the local level systems thinking, how would it affect things around me? So more rainstorm storms or snowstorms. If you personally love ice skating or playing hockey or uh, just anything to do with outdoor winter activities that involve snow and ice, you might think, hey, more snowstorms, fantastic. Well, how would that affect things around me? And this is where leading questions from educators can be helpful. Looking at what, well, what would the snow impact the people who live in town? What about people, people who live on farms and their driveway is half a kilometer long and they have to rely on their neighbor who happens to have a snowplow to dig them out so that they can go to school or go to work and what are the implications of not being able to go to work and not being able to to gain that income so with the teacher as a guide guiding with these questions you can quite quickly get young learners thinking just beyond their own individual sphere that individual sphere of well i like butterflies and i'm glad that i get to see more of this big butterfly uh, because of a warming climate. You know, how does more sunshine impact the farmers in your area? I live in an area with many farmers. Uh, more sunshine, less sunshine. You can, with uh, maybe grade three, four students, start looking at what do local farmers need in terms of rainfall amounts for their growing season. There was a 10-week drought last summer in my local area here in southeastern Ontario. And I remember messaging with one of my farmer friends who said, if it had have rained last night, it would have saved us thousands of dollars. These are local things that can be measured and quantified that engage the system's thinking. So starting local, a very important starting point, and there are many different uh, routes to that, and that's just one of the many from the book. Another is positive associations. And I already mentioned about how storytelling itself, just as a practice, can create positive associations because it engages the perceptive uh, and inquiry-based parts of our minds. But positive associations can also be engaged with gaming, running around, having fun, being outside, engaging in friendly competition. And this is where uh, one of the most popular activities in our Teaching Kids, uh, Teaching Kids book comes into play, the carbon dioxide game. This is by Sashi Kaufman. Uh, really engaging, really fun. You can even just see from the photo the general idea of uh, how this works, but I'll just sort of walk you through the basic instructions here. So uh, using whatever materials are available to you, uh, chalk is a popular one. You're going to create 
two concentric circles on the ground. Uh, you can also just draw lines in the sand or just in the mud. It really depends on your context. But uh, your two concentric circles, the smaller one is about one meter in diameter and it is inside a larger one that's about five meters in diameter. And of course, these are approximate. They can be shifted depending on the number of students you have with you. And the idea is that the smaller circle inside is the Earth and the larger circle represents the boundaries of the Earth's atmosphere. So the space between the boundary of the smaller circle and the larger circle is the atmosphere itself. And you're going to play the car carbon dioxide game in multiple rounds. So in round number one, you're going to have two students who will be CO2 molecules and they are going to be static. They will not be able to move. They will be just placed within the Earth's atmosphere. And all of the other students who will be placed outside of the Earth's atmosphere, so outside the larger of the two circles, will represent sunbeams. So what do the sunbeams have to do? Well, they have to enter the Earth's atmosphere. They have to tag the Earth and escape the atmosphere without getting tagged by the static CO2 molecules. If they do get tagged by the CO2 molecules, they must freeze in the atmosphere. So you can probably start to see where this is going. The more sunbeams get trapped in the Earth's atmosphere, the warmer it gets. And again, then you can get into systems thinking, talking about climate systems. A little wrinkle with this game to make it even more exciting is adding the what did human do cards. And this is very much in the spirit of the survival game. And for anybody who's played the survival game, it's just one of my absolutely favorite games, uh, all about teaching people about the food chain. And if you've not heard of it, I'm sure you can find it just with a quick internet search, the survival game. The survival game has different external inputs from different factors. And that is the case with the what did humans do cards in the carbon dioxide game. So the idea is every round you draw a different what did humans do cards. And you can draw these names out of a hat, add a fun element to that. Um, so just a few examples of the what did humans do cards. And these are not strictly on the negative side. It's, it's all round. So on the greenhouse gas producing side, we have things like humans drive cars, humans drive even more cars, humans cut down trees, humans burn trash. And you can see different numbers of CO2 molecules represented by kids are added to your atmosphere, depending on which what did humans do card you draw. Now on the bottom part of this, you can also see withdrawing carbon dioxide molecules or removing carbon dioxide kids from the Earth's atmosphere. So humans ride bikes. It's the most energy efficient form of transportation and it's lots of fun. Humans planting trees, humans creating energy efficient technology. You can open that up into a really interesting discussion using some local examples, humans recycle. So as each round goes, you draw a what did humans do card that affects the number of CO2 molecules, which will probably affect the number of sunbeams who get trapped in each round of play. And all of a sudden students are thinking about the different ways that G GHGs get into the atmosphere and different ways that they can be reduced or taken out of the atmosphere. Now, I, I do want to mention as, as a side note for the perceptive among us, uh, th the whole idea of carbon offsets is a, a fascinating discussion and a discussion that uh, is fraught with a lot of uh, deception and greenwashing. Uh, you've probably seen on airplane tickets, you know, for only $20, you get to offset your flight. Well, it, it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, a really good resource for this is Mark Jackard's recent book. It came out in February of 2020, The Citizen's Guide to Climate Success. If you read chapter nine, he talks about the carbon offsets that actually are offsets and examples that are not offsets. So just using the Canadian example, something that we sometimes hear is, well, Canada's carbon neutral, you know, because of arboreal forests. It's like, well, they're not new. <laughs> and that's just one dimension of this broader discussion. I, I won't get fully into that, but uh, this is more a discussion that would be appropriate for middle school and up. 
but I just wanted to mention Mark Jackard's book. It's open source. You don't actually need to buy it. You can, but it's open source on these uh, on his website on Simon Fraser University, which is where he works. So uh, check that out if you want more in-depth information on offsets that are and offsets that aren't. But the general idea of this game is students are learning about the carbon cycle and they're having a lot of fun doing it. They're exercising, they're letting those endorphins run wild as they're running wild. And again, a positive association with carbon dioxide. I know for me, as a kid, if I heard the phrase climate change or carbon dioxide, I would shut off. And I've recently learned through the research that that t tends to be what happens for a lot of students. But you can create positive associations with games like this. Moving on to the teens and these activities, some could be adapted for younger grades uh, of the, the two main activities that will focus on. The second one in particular could be adapted for younger grades. Uh, the first one, uh, a bit less so. Uh, one of the big focus areas, and there's reams of research on this, is that we need to spend time in the solution space. How can we talk about this Mad Max-like future if we can't offer an alternative? And that's what those who have pushed back against climate change often say is like, well, all you're doing is telling us the bad things, but you're not giving us a solution. And though I don't necessarily agree with where that sentiment is coming from, they do kind of have a point. If you're not going to give a viable alternative, don't just tell us the problems. So spend time in the solution space. And there are lots of ways that you can do this. Uh, we'll just start before we, we dive into the book. This is something that uh, you're going to be seeing very soon. It's a, a, a new pilot project developed by a gentleman named Samuel Levac Levy. He's based in Halifax. And this game is about to come to market. It is a board game. I actually have a, a prototype of it right here. And kind of doubling down on the idea of focusing on solutions, it's called Solutions. And it is based on the solutions in Project Drawdown that I mentioned earlier. The whole purpose of the game is you're competing against other players for the most effective solution. And as you draw game cards, and you can see them in my hand there, uh, each game card describes a solution and you have to debate with your fellow players which solution you think would be the most impactful. And then you will flip it over and reveal what the actual ranking is from Project Drawdown. And depending on how accurate your rankings are, your thermometer goes up faster or slower. Each round is a, a different year progresses. You can see kind of underneath my hand in the picture there, the, the different dates. And then, then on the right hand side, the thermometer, the Paris target of 1.5 is noted, and then some of the other targets. So you'll be hearing more about this soon. We're in partnership with Sam to develop a teacher's guide to go along with this. And uh, I just think this is fantastic because rather than debating about whether we need to have solutions, you're getting people to debate about which solution is best. And if it gets heated, great. <laughs> I mean, my solution is better than your solution. Okay, we can work with that. So very excited about, uh, about this where, uh, where this game is going and uh, keep an eye out for it because it will be hitting market soon. So getting back into the book. Probably my personal favorite activity is this one called Teaching About Carbon Regulation. It is by Bruce Taturka. And this gets students doing a simulation based on three of the, the more standard solutions that are out there. So the three big solutions, all based on different regulatory frameworks. One is the very top-down command and control. And we see this in certain parts of the world. Another is a carbon tax. And right now we have the political will across Canada at the federal level to at least have carbon pricing to different extents. I'm not gonna get into the political aspect of it, but we do have carbon pricing plans from all of the major political parties federally in Canada. So we're, we're hearing a lot about carbon pricing. Yes, for some people, tax is a bad word, but carbon pricing, carbon tax, ultimately we're hearing a lot about that. And then cap and trade which is a really big one. And uh, Mark Jackard, I mentioned him earlier, Simon Fraser University, uh, his big thing is flexible cap and trade. And we'll, we'll talk about those uh, in a moment here. B basic idea with carbon tax is there is a price on carbon. 
with cap and trade, uh, government sets a regulation about what the cap is on carbon limits. If you go over the, the limit, you can buy credits from organizations that are under the limit. So how does this activity work? It's a simulation and the educator, presuming you have one educator for the group, is going to represent a, a fictitious but realistic body called the North American Greenhouse Gas Initiative or N-A-G-G-I. Sounds credible enough to be realistic. And then you're going to have approximately two students who are going to be your carbon brokers uh, and that will be relevant as you do simulations with carbon pricing and with cap and trade. And I'll explain that in more detail in a moment here. And then the remainder of the class are going to be split into six groups of approximately two to five students each. And each group will represent a fictitious but realistic coal powered utility company. And this, uh, this activity takes up many pages in the book, which you know, it can be photographed, photocopied, and the rest. This is an example of an information sheet that one of the groups representing a fictitious coal-powered utility company will get. So it's just kind of your, your basic Coles notes about the company. When were they created? What is their main source of fuel? What is their capacity? So you can see 700 megawatts. Uh, a few additional notes about what different... Uh, low carbon solutions would cost. So a high tech smokestack scrubber HTSS would cost $80 million. And how many millions of tons per year of CO2 or equivalents would be reduced. It also talks about how this would be affected, uh, affected under different scenarios under a command and control regulation where it's just you need to spend this much money and you need to reduce your emissions by this much. Totally inflexible. There's no difference in how you can do it. It's just, this is what you're doing and that's it. So how would, what would the cost be for them under that scenario? What would the cost be under a cap and trade regulatory scenario? How would the credits and offsets work? So the idea is under each scenario, each simulation, you start with command and control and you set each of the groups off to discuss, okay, what would command and control cost our company? So they look at their, their information sheet, okay, under that regulatory framework, it would cost us this much money per year. It would involve this much upfront cost. It would reduce CO2 emissions by this much. Would it reach the targets? Would it not reach the targets? How long would it take to reach the targets? And then each group can compare the results. And the idea is that there's no one size fits all solution. And in fact, this particularly inflexible solution is one of the most least effective because a lot of organizations will have, will suffer a lot under this kind of regulatory scenario. Then you do a, a simulation round based on carbon pricing. And this is where your two carbon brokers come in. So they're the ones that quantify the amount of CO2 that's reduced, the amount of CO2 uh, that is taxed, how much their price on carbon is going to cost per year. And then you can quantify it. You can take it a step further and you can chart this. You can put it in graphs, pie charts, line graphs, and, and the rest. And then in round three, which is the longer scenario, this one might take 20 or 30 minutes, do cap and trade regulation. And this is where your two uh, brokers can offer credits from companies that go under the 25% reduction limit as set by the teacher. And they can sell those credits back to organizations that go over the 25% reduction. And again, with each of these scenarios, you can compare how would this impact our organization? What are the pros and the cons? What would be the cost involved? How much investment would be required from the government? And then you can start getting into broader discussions like, Though market-based solutions are effective, it's been proven time and time again that a completely free market approach is absolutely insane. And there needs to be some degree of government intervention because companies left strictly to the designs of the market cannot completely, not all companies can completely meet certain regulations. So there does have to be investment from government in retrofitting and ideas like that. So there's lots of interesting systems thinking that can come into this activity. 
this is the worksheet that each group uses to chart their, their costs and their emissions reductions so that they can quantify the comparisons among the three different scenarios and among the six different companies among those three different scenarios. So lots and lots of content that can stem from this activity. And then the last activity that we'll look at is based on measurable local change. And this kind of bookends things nicely. We talked about starting local in teaching kids about climate change. And this is absolutely applicable to all age groups. We talk a lot about empowerment. That word comes up a lot when you hear about teaching kids, youths, adolescents, and teens, and young adults about climate change. And a good way to empower is to have measurable local change that they can see. And with that, you can devise something like a car trip reduction plan for your school. So this is based on the activity going off ramp by Arthur Orsini, which is also in our teaching teens book. And the idea is to gather information about the transportation habits within your school. So there's a great opportunity for outreach and public speaking and networking within the school and charting the data and then coming up with a plan. So this is a, a sampling of a survey that you might put out to people in your school. And this can be really instructive. Maybe you'll de it determines that only 2% of the people in your school, for example, use their bicycle to get to school. So maybe that's something that you want to focus your efforts on. And maybe your class can design posters about the benefits of cycling. Or maybe you notice, well, the reason why people aren't cycling to school is their school doesn't have enough bike racks. So maybe you do a fundraiser and you get bike racks for your school. Something real that you can see. Something that wasn't there before that now is there. And then you do the survey later in the school year. How many more people are now using their bikes? What percentage of a jump have you had from people using their bikes before and after you implemented this initiative? Now, this is not to say that the small incremental changes are the only path to a solution. Uh, the flip side of this is people will say, well, it's like, you know, using a shot glass on the Titanic. Yes, it saves a lot, but it doesn't save enough. While that is true and while large scale infrastructure changes do need to happen, the bottom line is we need to reduce the amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, period. Yes, we need large scale changes to reduce it by the amounts that have been outlined by the IPCC and in the Paris Agreement, but every bit does make some difference. And if the broader idea is to empower students to continue looking at solutions and perhaps get involved when they're older in infrastructure based solutions, it does have to start somewhere. And I know this is preaching to the choir saying it has to start somewhere to this crowd, but it cannot be forgotten. Now, with older students, that can also accompany that broader discussion that just by getting a few more people to bike to school isn't going to solve the problem, but it is a starting point that needs to be alongside infrastructure changes. But the big takeaway with that is they don't exclude each other. It's not like don't do small scale local changes. It's like do those and do the big infrastructure changes. Again, all solutions must be on the table. Uh, we have the solutions, we can do it. Bring it on, bring on the competition. Let's race to the top of the mountain for who has the most effective solution. And ultimately it is the everybody wins type of scenario. So just kind of recapping the, the tools in the toolbox, we know that our, our timeline is short for making these changes. We know that education plays a big role in this, and we know that on the ground constructive solutions are necessary. And that's why I love the, the toolbox imagery. Our two books represent toolkits full of activities that are hands-on, that are classroom ready, that are applicable to other educational settings and that don't require a lot of time to prep. And they're interesting and they're fun and they get students thinking and thinking about systems. Just recapping our main takeaway points, starting local. You have to make it relevant to their situation. We can't only talk about Miami sinking when somebody's never been to Miami. We need to have positive associations. You can hear the word carbon dioxide without a pit forming in your stomach. Maybe it's, hey, that was really, really fun, that game that we played, this carbon dioxide game. 
Spend time in the solution space. This is something that you're going to see again and again in effective climate education and recommendations on effective climate education. Spend time in the solution space. Debate about solutions. Let students get heated in debating about solutions. It's a good place to get heated in and channel that competitive and creative and innovative spirit. And looking at measurable local change. And again, that's bookending it with the local note. And going right back to the beginning of the, the presentation, of course, it's important to engage emotions. I'm sure Jillian Judson is, is nodding her head there. Engage emotions, engage the imagination, the percep perceptive and inquiry-based parts of our minds. And a route to that is through storytelling. And if you can make the story local, all the better. And if you can make the story about a butterfly, they're beautiful. So that's a, b a benefit as well. Just before I fully finish off and continuing with the idea of uh, staying in the positive space and the solutions oriented space, uh, the podcast that we launched last year, which has been going really well, uh, we don't strictly talk about climate change. We talk about all aspects of, of environmental ed, but uh, some recent episodes, we've tried to make the climate change space an enjoyable space to discuss. And that is in no way to downgrade the, the scary aspects of it, which are very real and uh, we have to pay attention to. But this can be a space for positive conversations. In our, our 10th episode, which went out last month, we were talking about teaching environmental ed using comic books and comic book characters. Uh, an episode that just went live on Friday, we were talking about cli-fi, using children's fiction to teach about climate change, fun, relatable characters. And then the episode that goes out next week, we're talking about making climate change relatable to youths and also looking at gaps in climate education according to teens. And there's no reason these conversations need to be uh, steeped in doom and gloom. These can be lively, engaging proactive conversations. And that's certainly something that we're aiming for in our podcast and through our books. Again, these are available at Canada's nonprofit outdoor learning store, both the teaching kids and teaching teens about climate change. Uh, it's really been a pleasure being partnered with all of the partners uh, and Duncan and his entire team with CB and, and the outdoor learning store. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next steps in this developing relationship, uh, including a second podcast that Jade mentioned, Earthy Chats, that we're collaborating on. Uh, lots of very positive vibes. Uh, I should just mention Green Teacher. We still have our quarterly digital magazine, uh, which is useful. I noticed a few uh, folks mentioned they're from a homeschool community. This is increasingly popular with uh, those in a homeschool setting as well. So just thought I would mention that as a resource. And if you do need to get in touch with me, our website is fairly simple, greenteacher.com, and you can email me at ian at greenteacher.com. So stay local, stay in the solution space, empower students through measurable local change, engage their emotions through storytelling, and get to work. There's lots to do, but we can do it, and there are lots of enjoyable and interesting ways that we can do this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. That was fascinating. And I like um, how many different options for activities and things and different styles that are there that are some practical, some more like going through that inquiry. And I think um, you've given us lots to think about. We've coming to the end of our hour, I'm very aware of time. But what we'd love to do is just do our little quick draw prize um, for both the outdoor learning storm and then take me outside. And then we can get to the Q&A after. I'm hoping Ian's okay to stay around for a few minutes. Absolutely. Fantastic. As long you as you need. I, oh. I, just a quick note. I was going to, to do breakout rooms time permitting, but I, I think with a group as large as we have, uh, we, we don't have to do that. We can just jump right into the, the Q&A. So I'll just skip over that. Okay. Uh, and we'll probably talk about the what we were going to talk about in the breakout rooms in the discussion anyway. So. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, That's if you want to you know, lead that, that would be fantastic. Okay, so the first prize up for grabs um, from us at the Outdoor Learning Store is we'd love to offer one person a $50 voucher to the store. And in order to qualify to participate, 
rather than picking randomly, I'm going to ask you, fingers on buzzers or fingers on keyboards, get ready. First person to type the answer in the box wins. What was the name of the butterfly that Ian mentioned at the beginning and led in with the story? Ooh. <laughs> Um, ooh, Ian, does it need to be giant swallowtail to be specific or will swallowtail work? Uh, I, 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 half marks. I mean, it's a well, type in of which, swallowtail. In which case, Laura Javorka, you're first with giant swallowtail. Uh, congratulations. You're the winner of our $50 gift card. Please send me mm. a um, private message with your email and we will... Um, uh, send you your gift card in in the email space so well done thank you for participating everyone there was lots and lots of correct answers there and very speedy um that's it for us i'll pass you over to fahim hey everyone i'm here from take me outside and i'm going to be picking two winners for um outdoor field journals so they're weatherproof journals from take me outside and i'm not gonna you know do something super fancy like jade did that was very cool. Um, I've picked out the two random winners uh, based on the participants list. And the two winners we have for the outdoor field journal journals are Stephanie Padikan and Amira Choichu. And if I pronounce those um, last names wrong, I'm sorry, feel free to correct me in the chat, but you are the winners of our prizes. And um, if you can send me your email, that would be great too. But if not, no worries, I'll find it from the list and um, get in touch with you and mail you your journals. Fantastic. Prizes all round. So thank you so much for joining us. Those, if you do need to leave, we totally understand um, time and screen is, is, is a precious thing, but we are about to get into the nitty gritty of all these questions that have been itching on your mind. Um, so if you are leaving, goodbye. Thank you for joining us and engaging um, with, you know, all these people to learn about um, teaching kids and um, teens about climate change. And we hope you found some value here. Um, moving on, I'm going to crack into some questions there, um, Ian, if you're happy. Sounds good. Um, Katie asked pretty early on, um, how would you approach responding to a younger kid who already know and are maybe worried about climate change? There's, you know, some children in their home space have access to more information or are, you know, quite web knowledgeable or savvy and have already found some things out what how do you respond to that when it's already in there yeah so certainly you want to ask open-ended questions i mean how how does it make you feel uh, let them sort of lead with that and and also focus on the solutions and you know talk about how you know the ipcc even though you don't want to get into the nitty-gritty of it you can say this is the largest scientific project in human history that's been worked on and it's a collective action towards finding solutions and it's it's so long that most parents haven't read it and it, you know it's a hugely in-depth document and you can talk about you know people are developing games to get looking at these different types of solutions and you can give examples of success stories you know a cap and trade was used to combat acid rain you know that that was something when i was growing up was very much front and center you know you could see the evidence of it you could see the bricks on old buildings were stained with acid rain and a cap and trade regulatory system was a big part of curbing that major major issue that that was a big concern for a lot of people so it's not to totally kick the can down the road about the concerns and tell them that the concerns are not valid, but get a sense of where they are with those open-ended questions. Talk about the positives and tell them that it's a collective effort that many, 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 many people are working on, which is inspiring. And we probably still don't hear quite enough in the media about climate solutions, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you do, if you do know where to go to look for them, they are out there. And uh, that's just where you need to spend time, particularly with those younger grades until they're at that developmentally appropriate level to 
dig into the the problem side of things more so but still while accompanying that with the solution side excellent thanks pretty deep and meaningful and i guess yeah that relationship you have with that child giving them a space to share their their feelings is is pretty important um lynn asked are there any documentaries regarding climate change that we can watch on netflix there were a couple of suggestions from the chat which were cowspiracy and seaspiracy someone suggested climate wars on bbc david attenborough has also done a life on our planet um, I'd like to pip in with um, the podcast um, 2050, 2050 yeah. degrees of change, which is more, you know, it sort of does this scenario and then it talks to scientists. Um, wh what do you feel, Ian? How do you feel about some of those uh, documentaries or do you have any that you really connect with? Yeah, there's, there's one we're actually going to be doing a review of it in our next issue of the magazine. I'm just going to find it in my email here. It is called, just, just as I'm searching this, uh, another really good podcast is What on Earth with from CBC. That's uh, one of my must listen to's and they, they touch on a lot of dimensions of, of climate change and it's, it's not a downer type, uh, type show. They spend a lot of time talking about solutions. All right. The documentary is called uh, Race to Save the World. Now, this is this is not so much about the solutions. This is more about the extent that certain climate activists will go. Uh, this isn't the kind of thing that's going to make you feel a lot better necessarily about it. It's more to emphasize the severity of it. It is effective in what it is trying to do, but what it is trying to do is, is not strictly focus on solutions. Mm. Uh, but yeah, CBC's What on Earth is, is really good. The episodes are about 25, 30 minutes each, so very digestible and multiple interviewees per episode. And they, they cover all dimensions of it. And it's, it, I don't want to say it's a light show, just given that it is talking about a serious matter, but it is presented and produced in a, a light, accessible way. So mm. that's definitely high on the list. And I do totally understand that this is a serious um, undertaking to share that, but I do find that cowspiracy and seaspiracy can be a little bit um, inflammatory, the language they use and the way they present things. So sometimes um, I have watched A Life on Our Planet yeah. as well, and it's more... I mean, it's just more visually stunning than anything, and I think it just engages them, and then there's, like, the sort of sharing of, of, of the issue, and then it sort of leaves a bit of space for debate, Um so yeah, lots of options. I like like yours, Ian. Um, somebody asked, I'd like to ask if the activities in the book are all for larger group of kids, hmm. or if there are some that would work for smaller groups, i.e. homeschool groups or groups of two to six. Yeah, definitely. So uh, there are about 12 to 15 activities in each book, depending on the book. And a lot of them are uh, are very much applicable for for smaller groups and uh, you, you don't need to have 25 or 30 students so yeah they're they're certainly accessible there are some like the uh, in the teen book the, the activity that we talked about about the different regulatory situations that is better with a larger group uh, but can can still be done with a smaller group that can still be adapted you don't necessarily have to have groups if you have a group of six students it's just one student per company or maybe, uh, maybe you only have three companies instead of six utilities companies. So definitely adaptable. And then there are some that are totally fine for smaller groups, for sure. Okay, that's excellent and really helpful. Um, someone else has written, in my school, it's public school with 650 kids. I feel very isolated in the sense that I'm the only one who's willing to lead eco schools initiatives or sustainability projects. My colleagues refer to environmental projects, climate change, et cetera, as being my thing and not theirs. Uh, to stop being seen as a tree hugger and to engage colleagues who want to talk about climate change in their classrooms, do you have any suggestions for me to help empower them without overstepping? Yeah, that's, that's a huge thing. And uh, I was actually listening yesterday to a, a What on Earth episode that was titled how to talk to kids about climate change and they interviewed a teacher from saskatchewan 
who brings uh, narrative-based lessons into English class to engage discussion. And we have a similar activity like that in our Teaching Teens book. Um, yeah, it's certainly a stereotype that the word environment is associated with tree huggers and is this sort of other in a community. And really, that's where the local connections come in, is that climate change or just climate disruption, which is a term that's coming more into vogue now, uh, is not something that is strictly in the realm of science and the natural sciences. It's the, it's the realm of everybody's lives. I mean, look at the, the social impacts, the socio-political impacts uh, that we've seen fairly recently of climate refugees who have gone to different parts of Europe and have given rise to uh, very intolerant groups, uh, very extreme intolerant gr groups, uh, the likes of which we've unfortunately seen a rise of in a number of different countries. That's not science. That's not, that's absolutely not just, I mean, the science is part of it, of, of why sea levels are going up or why there are droughts or why there are famines. But, you know, what about the economic impact of different pricing schemes? I mean, what about how pensions that are tied up in fossil fuels that were, are not going to be used, how is that going to affect your pension? I mean, the pricing are, are based on projections assuming that it will be business as usual for the next 30 years when it won't be. And a, a really good book to read about this is a book, book called The Case for Climate Capitalism by Tom Rand. It's probably the least ideological book I've ever read. And really his thesis in that book is to completely do away with all ideology, everything, and just get down to business. And he's, he's not, you know, the, the title is maybe a bit misleading. It seems like he's, you know, total free market, no regulations, libertarian. It's not that at all. It's, we only have nine years. We know that politics is slow. The bureaucratic inertia is tremendous. We probably don't have time to completely overhaul our economic system in nine years. So let's use the system we have. Let's get government involved at appropriate levels and regulate where it needs to be regulated, invest where we need to invest, and just <laughs> solve the damn problem. It's kind of the tone of the book, but it's written in a very non-ideological way. He doesn't He criticizes the far extremes of different ideologies, but without doing it in a snide way. And I think this is a really useful book for talking to, you know, economics teachers, because it's like, if you're teaching your students about pensions, this is a, a great entry point, because it's like pensions that are based in fossil fuels aren't worth what people say they're worth. And people need to know that. <laughs> so that's a really good way to make it relevant to the here and now of, of people's lives. And there's so many interesting cross-cutting concepts, and that's a term I borrow from the Next Generation Science Standards, which they have in the US, which I think is just a wonderful framework. Uh, I wish we had something like that in Canada. Um, and that show, What on Earth, has a lot of great uh, tips on different ways you can engage the climate discussion, indigenous perspectives, you know, for indigenous studies classes. So. There, there are lots of great resources that you, you know, bring to the staff room, books you can recommend people to read uh, so that it's not just the realm of the tree hugger. I, mm -hmm. I've been on the receiving end of that. I, I can empathize very much so and just got to push through it. Maybe just leave the book, you know, the really direct That's book right. on, the, on, the, on the coffee table, you know, just spread five copies out. <laughs> just <laughs> giant, small hint. Holy. Yeah. Um, we're going to just have time for one or two more questions. Um, I'm going to start with Ellie's um, talking of books, who's asking, going from a flip side from the teacher perspective, all the way down to like kindergarten, grade three. Do you have any resources, read aloud books, for example, that would work for, for a kindergarten to grade three student? I can find that out and send it in the follow-up email tomorrow. I, I ha I, my finger is less on the pulse of mm -hmm. the, the read aloud children's books with Green Teacher, but I will find that out very soon and uh, I, I can give you a, quite an extensive list. Uh, and that's, I a find... really, that's a great question. I, I love that. 
I found that I um I look for poems about weather and um, that have actions and I do like a poem about the weather changing and you can sort of do this through the seasons and change and then you say but ooh, what's the difference between weather and climate and it's almost just like introducing that concept of you know climate just being weather over a long period of time I'd say that that's where I'm at when I teach K to three as opposed to like anything really about climate change it's just like what is this climate that you speak of so that they can get an understanding of the the basics before we get into the nitty-gritty of you know the greenhouse effect for example there's a couple of all in the the teaching kids book as well about climate versus weather sorry to interject no it's very important and that's that's it get it in there okay um we do have some people that say that some Kim says I hug trees daily and it's good for the soul. Well, yeah, like, I should also add like, not, uh, you know, words like nature geek and tree hugger are, are not put downs in, in my realm. And I'm sure for many people here, no, these are wonderful to hug. Absolutely. Definitely. And Wildsight just did a campaign where we would like hashtag tree hugger and lots of pictures yeah. of, of tree hugging. So I'm with you entirely. Yeah. Um, we've, I think that's it for the questions. If anyone else has got one last one that, woo, nerds unite, I like that. Um, yeah, nerds, also a good word. Love yes, that. isn't it just? Um, okay. Um, oh, I had to sort of personal question to finish then. Um, for me, what I found has worked well with talking about technology and, you know, things like, like kids like Boy M. Slat, who was like a teenager and developed this, you know, ocean cleaning machine and, and engaging youth with, with being empowered. Um, do you feel like that's, that's key to connecting them is like to, to link climate change and technology because they are all so technologically advanced? Oh, oh, for sure. I mean, we, we hear about techno optimists and, you know, sometimes that can also be used as a form of greenwashing is, yeah, we have all the great technology. It's like, well, we have to use it. But yeah, I mean, technology is, is a huge part of the path towards the solutions and, you know, engaging people in things like, you know, Elon Musk has been quoted saying, you know, why is it that I'm the only one creating electric cars? Uh, that's not the case now, but, you know, it's kind of neat to see you know, a guy who is in a, a for-profit business who's saying like, yo, where's the competition? Like, come on, <laughs> let, let's get cracking here. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that that level of technology is great. And, you know, talking about how the price of solar panels have, have come down, you know, hugely and what are the benefits of, of EVs and all of that stuff, I think, is very, very important. And all the research about effective climate education includes mention of that because technology is a huge part of the solutions. And I just feel like you've provided so many solutions. I feel like I feel optimistic at the end of this by, yeah, engaging with with some positive stories and with some some really engaging activities that that aren't just rate from one to 10, how depressed you feel about climate change, you know, which I saw once on something else and thought, God, what an awful idea. Yeah. It's absolutely great for you to share with me, but I'd rather let's sit down and talk about what we can do rather than what we feel, uh, you know, overwhelms us. So thank you so much. Um, I think that was the most amazing workshop and uh, you can get both of those books, Teaching Kids and um, Teens about climate change in the outdoor learning store. And um, there's been a host of, of resources. And in that email coming out tomorrow, we'll have links to some of that and to our partners and to the recording. So if you've missed anything, um, you can catch up then. Um, thank you, Ian. As always, it's super engaging and uh, fascinating. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you everyone for being part of this experience tonight. And I hope to maybe get to meet some of you in person someday. Okay. Well, happy evening. Um, enjoy your Thursday and then TGI Friday tomorrow. And uh, we'll look forward to hopefully catching up with you in our next workshop and uh, on Tuesday. And um, yes, thanks again, Ian, for your fantastic fantastic efforts. Thank you.